Thank you for joining us for this sermon podcast from United Church on the Green, located in New Haven, Connecticut. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are invited and welcome. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministry at United Church on the Green, please visit our website at unitednewhaven.org. Thank you. This morning's readings come from the books of Luke and Matthew. The first reading is Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38, which can be found on page 56 of the New Testament in the few Bibles. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is to be the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The second reading. is from Matthew, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, found at page 35 in the New Testament of your two Bibles. Now the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. Friends, God is still speaking. Let our hearts be open to listen and understand. Would you pray with me, please? O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your presence. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Why Mary? 
She doesn't seem like a likely candidate for mother of God. She was young, barely out of childhood herself, a teenager, presumably in the midst of all the ungainly awkwardness of puberty. She was poor, with very few resources. She was an unmarried woman, which meant she had no social standing, no property, no status, according to the order of the time. She was not an important person in the eyes of her society. She was Jewish, which meant she was a member of a persecuted ethnic group and a follower of a persecuted religion. She came from Nazareth, a rural forgotten backwater of the Roman Empire, a place where nothing important ever happened. Why Mary? If God the Almighty, God the Omnipotent, God the Eternal, God the Immortal, God the Omniscient, God the All-Powerful, if God wanted to enter human life, why would God choose to be born of Mary? God could have chosen a powerful mother, the wife of King Herod, say, or Governor Quirinius, or even the Emperor Caesar Augustus himself. God could have chosen to be a prince or a priest, to grow up in a palace or a manor house. God could have chosen a wealthy mother, the wife of a trader, a landowner, a business person, someone in whose household Hunger and scarcity would be foreign concepts. God could have chosen a mother who lived someplace that mattered, a big city, Jerusalem or Rome, a place where important people came and went, a place where important business was transacted, a place where important decisions were made. God could have chosen power, wealth, importance. God could have chosen to be sheltered from difficulty and suffering. God could have chosen to be born into a life of ease and plenty and a silver spoon, but that is not what God chose. God chose Mary, a poor, unwed Jewish teenager from Nazareth, and in so doing, God chose vulnerability, humility, Poverty and struggle. Why, Mary? Because vulnerability and humility and poverty and struggle are at the very heart of the Incarnation. If what God wanted was to remain at a safe distance from suffering, then why enter human life on this war-torn earth at all? If what God wanted was to stay sheltered from hunger and pain and death, then why assume a fleshly mortal body? If what God wanted was to retain infinite power and omnipotent might, then why become a fragile, finite, fallible human creature? The heart of the Incarnation is that God chose to become vulnerable, to know what it is to shiver in the cold and sweat in the heat, to skin a knee or break an arm, to feel weary or heartsick or afraid, to be buffeted by powers and principalities not of your own making, to lose a friend, to fail, to be rejected, to be betrayed, to know that one day you will die. And because God chose this, because God chose Mary, we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that nothing human is foreign to God. No experience we can have is distant from God's experience. Nothing we can do and nothing that can be done to us can ever separate us from God. This is what we mean when we call Jesus Emmanuel, God with us. Because Jesus was born as Mary's child, we know that God does not shy away from the broken places in our world and in our lives, but rather chooses to go there, to share them with us, and to teach us how to transcend them. But then Mary was not unique in her social location. There were plenty of poor, unmarried Jewish teenagers in rural Palestine. There were plenty of households in which Jesus could have experienced hardship and struggle. So why Mary? 
Well, how many people do you know who are prepared to say yes when God comes calling in that kind of a way? <laughs> there is a reason why in the Bible when God appears to a person, the first word out of God or the angel's mouth is usually, do not be afraid, and that is because a divine manifestation is frankly terrifying. And not only that, but the thing God was asking of Mary was terrifying. It was a serious proposition with life-changing consequences. There is a poem I love written by a South African poet named Isabel de Grouchy called No One Knows My Name that goes like this. I am the girl that no one's heard of. No one remembers, no one cares, no one even knows my name. Could it be that I never lived? Yet that far off day seems more real now than many other. Early spring light, soft and pink on the shutters, was suddenly shadowed by the imposing form of a stranger, tall and serious. Greetings, the Lord is with you. And seeing, I trembled. Do not be afraid, I have a message for you. You will bear a son and he will inherit his father David's throne. I stood still as a statue while my thoughts whirled and jangled. I was not married. I was too young. It must be a joke. Who was this man anyway? Was I really hearing this word or imagining it? He stood waiting, and I cried out, Oh no, I'm not the one. Don't ask me. There must be someone else. The light in his eyes dimmed, not a vision surely, but of deep sorrow. You know, don't you, where he went? And that is why no one knows my name. I love that poem because it invites us into that experience, into that moment of Gabriel's annunciation, and it also reminds us that Mary had a choice in the matter. Gabriel may well have gone to who knows how many other people before he arrived at Mary's doorstep. No was an option when it came to responding to that request. And Mary, contrary to the way she is portrayed in much of our art and music and popular imagination, she was anything but demure and submissive. In the second reading we heard, Joseph received a message in a dream and waking did as he was instructed. Mary spoke back to the angel. She asked questions. And only when she knew what she needed to know, only when she understood what she needed to understand did she give her consent, let it be with me according to your word. And beyond her willingness to say yes to that unusual request from God, how many people do you know who are prepared to parent a child like Jesus? I mean, he can't have been an easy kid to raise. He was always breaking rules, always crossing lines, always talking to people he wasn't supposed to talk to, eating with people he wasn't supposed to eat with, going places he wasn't supposed to go, doing things he wasn't supposed to do, saying things he certainly wasn't supposed to say. How many parents do you know, teenage or otherwise, who could handle that handful of a child and raise him into the man whose story we still tell? and in whose name we still gather today. Mary could, we know this because she did, but Mary made her capacity clear long before Jesus started healing and teaching and proclaiming good news. Mary showed her chutzpah right from the get-go. She asked questions of Gabriel, she gave her affirmative consent, and then she sang a song of praise to God for that unplanned, unexpected, unconventional pregnancy, a song we now know as the Magnificat, a version of which we will sing as today's closing hymn. It goes like this, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for God has looked with favor on the lowliness of this servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is God's name. And then she went on to sing praise for God's justice and mercy, praise despite all evidence to the contrary. She sang it as though it was already true. We call that prophetic imagination. 
God's mercy is for those who fear the Lord from generation to generation. God has shown strength with an arm. God has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. If this was the lullaby Jesus heard in utero, if this was the cradle song Mary sang to him while she rocked him to sleep at night, then it's no wonder her child turned out like he did. With a mother like that, it's no wonder Jesus turned the whole world on its head. It's no wonder he spent his time with the poor and the outcast. It's no wonder he healed people no one else would even look at, let alone touch. It's no wonder he fed people with loaves and fishes and stories of God's saving grace. With a mother like that, it's no wonder he told of a love stronger than fear, stronger than hate, stronger than violence, stronger even than death, and then lived like he meant it and proved that it was true. Why, Mary? Because of her circumstances and because of her nature, Mary was a special case and she had a special call but even if our circumstances are different from Mary's, what with most of us not being poor, unmarried, pregnant Jewish teenagers in rural Palestine 2,000 years ago, we are no less called to be bearers of God than Mary was when we join our voices and our actions with Mary's song. When we commit ourselves to the cause of justice and peace, we help to make this world look a little more like God yearns for it to be. When we say a courageous yes to God's call on our lives, even if we are afraid, even if we don't know whether we can do it, even in spite of what the consequences might be, we ourselves will be transformed, even as we transform the world. And when we go to the vulnerable places, the places where there is hardship and struggle, suffering and pain, when we bear God's light into those deepest of shadows, it is there that we find Jesus already at work, doing just what his mama taught him. Amen.